so uh, Ruth 1, um, it tells us Ruth 1, 1, now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled. So it clearly gives a context. So this is kind of important, not just in knowing the time period, but what kind of context this was, um, what context this took place in. So it was the time of the judges. So there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. Now the name of the man was Elimelech, the name of his wife was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and uh, Chilion, uh, Ephraimites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to the country of Moab and re remained there. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband died, and she was left and her two sons. Now they took wives of the woman of Moab, the name of the one was Orpha, and the name of the other was Ruth, and they dwelt there about ten years. Then both Malon and Achilion also died, so the woman survived her two children and her husband. Okay, so it just really lays it out really straightforward. Um, just going straight to the point. Uh, so, first of all, like I said, it was the time of the judges, and as you know, the whole cycle of the time of the judges, it was a really horrendous time, as we saw from many examples. The mix of paganism, the influence of it. Something that's important to know is when the professing people of God, people that identify themselves as God's people, when they apostatize, Usually it's not just outright, oh, there's no God, or we're going to abandon Yahweh God, the one true God, and go to some other God. It's not that. Like you saw, not only in the book of Judges, but actually in the whole of the Old Testament, when people apostatize, like remember when uh, Elijah, Eliyah, when uh, he, was out, he was at Mount Carmel, he told the people, choose which God it's going to be. If Yahweh is God then follow him. If, if Baal is God, follow him. And they were all hesitant. And So it's not like they were in a place where, oh, there's no Yahweh, or we don't worship him, no more Yahweh, we're going to go with Baal. No, it's not that. It's a mixture. Yahweh, yes, but also Baal, yes. And that's what's supposed to be scary, because that implies that just because somebody is claim to Yahweh doesn't necessarily mean they're not apostate. So in American Christianity, it's not it's not the atheists or those who say, oh I don't belong I don't believe in Jesus anymore. It's those who say they believe in Jesus. How they can be apostates. Are you getting that? Just like Israel they weren't saying, it's just Baal, no more Yahweh. No, we, we worship Yahweh. We want him. But we also want Baal. So today, many times it's, yes, Jesus, yes, yes, we worship Jesus. I love Jesus. But also, the pagan world, or money, or whatever sin. So that's supposed to be, um, like, in a way, enlightening. That's supposed to be, like, Shocking, that's supposed to be like wake people up. So, the, it's the time of the judges, and there was a famine in the land, and probably based on judges, this would be a time of God's judgment. Because remember, the whole cycle. And also, according to the covenant, you know, God clearly established the covenant. Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28, which lays out the blessings and the curses. If you keep the covenant, obey his law, then God's going to bring all these blessings, these positive things, prosperity, material prosperity, family, in the field, everything, every area. But if you break the covenant, if you don't remain faithful to the covenant, then famine, uh, wars, other countries coming in, on and on. And it tells us that there was a famine in the land. Now, Usually we can't assume that just because there was a famine, it was God's judgment. Usually. But this is Old Covenant. And there was clearly that promise. The covenant. So based on that, 
And based on the whole background of judges, it probably was the case that because they were apostate, God had brought judgment. And so it's pretty evident that because of the famine, now, as I said before, for us in, a, in the 21st century American context, we can't really relate to this. Because even if there is a famine, well, we, we got bread, we got, we got food. Uh, go just go to the grocery store. Uh, there's importing, exporting, there's trading going on all over the world. Uh, even if a whole country, I mean, usually a whole country doesn't even suffer that way, but certain regions in the world, you know, there are droughts, you know, California, whatever, all this stuff. Even if that kind of goes on, it doesn't really affect us. But you have to remember in this context, when there's a famine, like literally you can die. I mean, you know, the whole Genesis account, like the whole thing of uh, Joseph and stuff, like the whole famine all, all over the place. And they had to like sell everything they had to. I mean, it, it's devastating. It's serious. Even my parents' generation, I remember, uh, well, my, my father used to say like, I, they were in a much more difficult situation, like just a generation or two ago where like, yeah, they, they know more of this. So they had, they decided this uh, Elimelech, he takes his family over to Moab. So you see, uh, I don't know what translation you have, but in verse one, there's a famine in the land and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn. So that Hebrew word is sojourn. So it's a temporary dwelling. He didn't decide to just permanently move over. That's kind of important. So I don't know what translation you have. Do, do you guys have sojourn or do you have like temporarily dwell? He went to the country of Moab to, to what? Okay, went to live for a while, I see. So, live for a while. It doesn't necessarily say live like permanently. So, live for a while. But yeah, the word indicates just temporarily living there. Because remember, the situation is because of the famine, he needs to go somewhere where like it's a little better. But what ends up happening? Well, they, they move over there. And um, at the end of verse 2, and they went to the country of Moab and remained there. So it indicates that even though the initial plan was just to temporarily be there, just probably until um, either the famine was over in, in Israel or even just Bethlehem or something, that region, uh, or once they get enough food and stuff, um, things get better. To move back but it says they remain there and as we can see you know the husband dies and then uh, the two sons marry I mean verse 4 now they the sons took wives of the woman of Moab right away you're supposed to recognize yeah that's that's a problem because you're not supposed to marry pagan women that now there are some people who say no, no, that only applied to the Canaanite women because uh, there are specific things about that in like Deuteronomy and places. But the problem is, what's the basis for um, when it comes to the passages where it specifically goes into the Canaanite women not to intermarry with them? What's the basis of that? Is it like race? No, it's because religion. It's because of the faith. And so... All countries, all people had their own gods. That was the basis for the prohibition of intermarrying. But that's broken. The sons marry these women. So you're supposed to recognize that as a problem. Uh, the name of the one was Orpha and the name of the other was Ruth. And they dwelt there about 10 years. So you see that uh, now we don't know exactly when the husband died, how long he had been. But by the time the sons get married, they end up having lived there about 10 years. So that's definitely not sojourning. That's definitely not a temporary travel. Now, here's why I want to point this out. Initially, they were planning, and, and, and mainly it, it would be the parents, but um, 
I mean, we don't know if it was mainly the man, he was more just leading it, or it was more like a mutual husband, wife, both kind of deciding going to Moab and things like that. But though the initial plan was we're, ju we're just going to temporarily live there, they end up living there for a long, long time. And the reason I point that out is, this is how a lot of things start out. Um, now let me back up a little bit. Was it okay, was it fine for them to uh, move over to this pagan land? That's the initial issue. Now, I know some pastors say, oh, there's no prohibition. That was fine. And, and I'm pretty sure that is true, that there is no specific verse. There's no specific word in the law saying you're not supposed to travel to some other land and live there. But I think, uh, like other pastors will say, this was probably a wrong decision because, I mean, the whole thing of the promised land, I mean, it's the, it's the promised land. It's very special. It's one of the most uh, significant things, almost in the Bible, like the whole promise of the land. God promised uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the whole land thing, the land promise. And they inherited that land. And so to move away from that land, to go to a pagan land, and also the whole issue of, I mean, think about it. You're supposed to offer sacrifices to God. Think about that part. This was a time period where no Jerusalem was not established yet, but they had the uh, a tabernacle, they had the Ark of the Covenant there, and they were supposed to bring offerings there. And also God gave the clear law, you're supposed to um, come three times a year to, um, you know, the seven feasts, the three of them, they're supposed to go to God's temple area and celebrate the Passover there. So based on all these things, it's kind of implied that you're supposed to live in the promised land. But they move to a pagan land with all the pagan influence. And so um, what I was going to say is, just like how they initially started out with, you know, we're just going to temporarily live there and just come back. But they ended up just living almost permanently. That's how sin usually works. This is a really important point I'm making. Usually when people um, decide to do something maybe sinful or kind of like borderline, they don't plan on, uh, let's say, um, I'll just use a very common example. I'm just using this because it's a very common example. Uh, many times when Christians are dating and stuff like that, uh, they'll... Sometimes they make up a certain rule. You know, um, we're going to make sure these are the boundaries. Uh, we're only going to like hold hands or something or we're, um, I, I don't know like what standard. I mean, I, I wouldn't be surprised if these days they're like saying, oh, only a kiss on the cheek or uh, whatever. But while they set certain boundaries, this happens all the time. Whereas they like become all close to each other and things like that, they more and more push the boundaries and they many times end up going all the way, like fornicating and things like that. That's common. They don't plan right away, hey, you know what? We're boyfriends, girlfriends, we're going to have sex. They don't do that. Initially, it's like, oh yeah, we have these boundaries. We're going to have these clear limits and things like that. But little by little, it's pushed more and more and more. Even And eventually they're like fornicating. That's common. I'm sure uh, even unbelievers or professing Christians. Uh, this happens with all kinds of things. On the internet, uh, you know, dating stuff, um, all kinds of sins. Um, I don't know, maybe tax related things. Oh, I'm just going to make sure, you know, about this much. I'm going to. But then little by little, they're pushing, pushing it till like they're totally sinning. So, yeah, uh, it's just a huge thing. And so. With them uh, traveling to Moab, I really uh, lean towards this having been wrong for them to go to a pagan land. Because, um, yeah, because of what I said. But they end up just living there for a long time. So we can see that. And so the, the dad dies and then the two sons, they get married to pagan women. You totally see this going on. And then they live there about 10 years. 
And you notice that uh, they clearly got married. And um, it, they probably were married for a few years. But you notice they have no children. Now, I know I, I need to be careful not to go too far into it. But it's definitely possible that God didn't uh, give any children intentionally. Because you have to remember during this time, having children was absolutely huge. It's connected to survival and um, no children. And then verse 5, both uh, Ma Malon and uh, Kilion also died. So the woman survived her two children and her husband. For us in the 21st century, especially America, of course this is tragic. We, we obviously know that. But we don't understand how devastating this is. Because... Um, as I said before, widows were in the most difficult place. You know, obviously, based on how God designed us, women aren't able to work as well, uh, the physical strength and things like that. That's what That was mainly the men's responsibility. And so they don't get hired as well. And if you're older, I mean, that's even worse. And so if you're somebody in the original context, you, you just know right away, this is the most devastating, horrendous situation. You left the country with your husband and your two sons. And as you probably know, even today, there are a lot of regions in the world where um, son are more preferred. Sons are more preferred. And I know you guys you would know about, you know, when China had the whole one child policy thing going on. Uh, I don't know how many how many daughters would have gotten aborted based on the male preference. Um, I mean, there are different reasons for that, but um, normally, like in, in these contexts, uh, boys are more preferred. And so she had these two sons, but they died and she's left alone. So the kind of uh, depression, mourning that would have gone on is just, you just, yeah, we don't understand how devastated she would have been. So um, as we, I mean, hopefully you read, but you know, she ends up um, hearing, um, so just verse six, she arose with her daughter-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab that Yahweh had visited his people by giving them bread. Therefore she went out from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her. And they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go each, go return each to her mother's house. Uh, Yahweh deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. Yahweh grant that you may find rest each in the house of her husband. So she kissed them and they lifted up their voices and wept. And then we know that eventually, um, one of them ended up just going back. But then, uh, I'll just read verse 11. Naomi said, turn back my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there still sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Remember, uh, having a husband was really huge. Uh, just That's just how everything was. And even today, um, many times that is the case. Um, verse 12, turn back, my daughters, go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband tonight and should go, and also should uh, bear sons, would you wait for them till they were grown? Would you restrain, restrain yourselves from having husbands? No, my daughters, for it grieves me very much for your sakes. Because the hand of Yahweh has gone out against me. So she recognizes uh, God is probably involved in this, the fact that she lost everything. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpha kissed her mother-in-law, kissed her goodbye. But Ruth clung to her, and she said, Look, your uh, sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her, to her gods. Return after your uh, sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I'll lodge. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be. Will I be buried? Yahweh do so to me and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. So, um, yeah, she decided, you know, your God, Yahweh, your God will be my God. I will convert to your religion, your God. 
And uh, when she saw that she was determined to go with her, she, Naomi stopped speaking to Ruth. Now the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem. And it happened when they had come to Bethlehem, all the city was excited because of them. And the woman said, Is this Naomi? But she said to them, Do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. Um, so the word uh, Naomi, you probably have it in your Bible note. Naomi means like pleasant or my delight. Pleasure, pleasant, my delight. That's her name. That, that's the name, the meaning of her name. But don't call me that. Call me Mara. And I think just from the way it sounds, you can kind of sense bitterness. Mara, uh, it means bitter. Uh, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full. Look at this. I went out full and Yahweh has brought me home again empty. Why do you call me Naomi since Yahweh has testified against me? The Almighty has afflicted me. So, yeah, like I said, she went with a husband and two sons. But she ironically ends up with them gone and this one daughter-in-law. And like I said, in today's context, if that happens, I mean, of course, obviously tragic, but it wouldn't be as much of an extent as, as the same degree. But in this time period, with the whole thing of men having a husband, having sons, it was actually just, in a way, embarrassing it would have been, humiliating. Like a modern day example is like, you know, you leave the country with millions of dollars and a wonderful business and you're up there with a million dollar house and stuff and nice cars and then you come back with everything destroyed. You come back with nothing. It's kind of like that. Just... uh and she knows God is sovereign. Now, here's something that's a little bit tricky. Was this God's judgment? Or is this just that this just ended up happening this way? It can be a little tricky. Uh, I have to lean towards this being something of God's judgment. Because of the fact that they went to a pagan country and then they married Moabite women and they probably became paganized. And so God uh, bringing some justice. I know there are plenty of uh, Christians today that would say, no, this is just, it just ended up happening that way. And Naomi, she's just bitter against God because God let it happen that way. So there would be some people that would just say more like, oh, God permitted that to happen. But um, I think it's, I lean more towards, I have to lean more towards like 60, 40, maybe. This, w this would have been something of uh, God's judgment involved. But, um, yeah, as we will see in the following, maybe tomorrow, God working in such amazing ways. Because as you, if you know the book of Ruth, this very woman that lost her two sons, she does end up getting uh, a grand grandson who ends up being what? The line of David and the line of Jesus, the Messiah. So what's amazing is this pagan woman from Moab, way out there, hundreds of miles away, some pagan land, a pagan woman, she ends up being a woman involved in the line of the Messiah, God, being born into the world. So this is where you see this thing. I mean, you see this all over the place, but even with sinful choices, that has consequences, God ends up bringing about good. He accomplishes plan even through sinful choices. It's just like Joseph, uh, David himself, he uh, took advantage, he used his power and pretty much raped Bathsheba. And with her end up having Solomon, who becomes the lion. So this is kind of the mysterious in a way fascinating, in a way just intriguing ways that God works. There are consequences for our actions. Please don't dismiss that. Please don't ignore that. There are. Like look at her situation. She lost her husband and two sons. But in the midst of that, God, in God's sovereign plan, he ended up getting this pagan woman who would be uh, one of the mothers of the Messiah. So... Any questions or thoughts as we go to John? 
So John, uh, last time we saw down to John 3.21 and uh, now John 3.22. After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea and there he remained with them and baptized. This would have been water baptism. Now John also was baptizing in Anon uh, near Salim because there was much water there. And they came and were baptized, for John had not yet been thrown into prison. Then there arose a dispute between uh, some of John's disciples and the a Jew about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you, that, that Jesus, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing, and everyone is going to him. Okay, so... As we see in verse 22, Jesus and his disciples, uh, they were water baptizing people. And if you, I think you would know that John the Baptist was sent before Jesus and John the Baptist, he baptized people unto repentance, preparing the way of the Messiah, Messiah's coming. So he, he ministered first and, and then Jesus appeared. But, and so, so people were going to John the Baptist but now with the appearance of Jesus, and now Jesus and his disciples are baptizing, people that used to go to John the Baptist, they're all going to him. They're all going to Jesus now. So that's what's being said here. Rabbi, um, that, that Jesus over there, like, about whom you testified, look, he's water baptizing and everyone's going to him and not you. Okay, so in this kind of situation, what's kind of expected is, Okay, so you used to be kind of like, I mean, not necessarily popular, but you used to be kind of like um, brought up and you were the one that were, that was like kind of, that kind of became famous and well known and everyone was coming to you and they were noticing you, you were the news in the town, as a matter of fact, probably all over Israel, like you were the one that was, that had the spotlight, but now the spotlight is all on Jesus. And so what's expected is something like, hmm, yeah, um, I'm a little um, disappointed about this or I'm getting a little jealous. Um, maybe I need to do something to get people's attention, kind of get the uh, attention back to me, like something of that. But look at 27. But John answered and said, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. Heaven's talking about God. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I'm not the Messiah, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands, at, stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is complete. Okay. First of all, 27, that a person can receive nothing unless it's been given to him from heaven. Basically, God determines it. He's the one that's going to decide whether you exist or not, what you will be, what you will have. It's all up to God. And my role that I've been, I was given, uh, this was how much God gave me of my role, simply to point to Him. He's the highlight. He's the one the spot, spotlight is on. I'm just somebody on the side that was pointing to him. And you, you yourselves, you guys yourselves bear me witness that I said, I clearly said, I'm not the Messiah, but I've just been sent before him. And verse 29, the one that has the bride is the bridegroom. So the contrast between the bridegroom versus the best man in marriage, they had that kind of thing during this time too, kind of the best man, the friend of the bridegroom. So the friend of the bridegroom, they help out with weddings. And, you know, you, you've, if you've been to weddings and if you've experienced, you know, wedding contests, you, you know how this works, that the focus is on, the, high, the, the spotlight is on who in marriage. Of course, it's the husband and the bride, the, the, the groom and the bride. And other people on the side, they're all working hard to support them, to serve them. And that's how it was here too, that I'm simply the friend of the bridegroom. I'm simply in the back. I'm on the side and I'm just supporting 
the main people. So the spotlight is on the bridegroom, Jesus. He's the Messiah. And uh, so the friend, he simply works on the wedding or the preparation of the wedding, things like that. And then the groom, the bridegroom appears. And when he appears, all the focus is now on him. He just keeps remaining on the side, right? So that's how, that's the analogy that he's using to make the point. The friend of the bridegroom who stands, hears the, the groom having come, and he rejoices greatly because the real person, he appeared now, he showed up. Because of the bridegroom's voice that he, he's arrived. And so this joy of mine is complete, is fulfilled. So my joy is not me getting the spotlight. My joy is him having the spotlight. So uh, my joy is the bridegroom, Christ, him getting the spotlight. And this joy of mine is complete. This is really huge, guys. This is exactly the case with us and Christ. We only point to Christ. He's everything. And we're just somebody on the side whose function, whose role is simply to point to him. That was John the Baptist's role and that's our role. We don't point to ourselves. Paul talks about this a little bit in like uh, 2 Corinthians 4. Uh, but um, yeah. And then verse 30, he must increase and I must decrease. That's such a huge passage. This is such a like foundational, fundamental like passage that's just so huge that he must increase and I must decrease. I know the context here with John the Baptist and Jesus, but this actually applies to all of God's people. He must increase and I must decrease, becoming less and less and nothing. See guys, let me tell you firmly, okay? There's a lot of Christianity around you in America where it's he must increase and I must increase too. That quote unquote Christianity is all around us. All kinds of false teachers and false ministers because they want to get people in to their ministry and their church. They tell people stuff that they would really like to hear. And with the man-centeredness of people, or excuse me, the, the self-centeredness of people, where it's all about them, they cater to those needs and wants. And so no one's going to say, okay, John 3.30, let's change it to like, he must increase and I must increase too. But their overall teaching, it has that flavor. It has that hint all around it. Self-esteem, self-esteem. Do you see self-esteem here? Did you see it? Verse 30? No. <laughs> it's kind of the opposite. And what's the, what's the opposite of self-esteem? Humility. Um, did you say humility? Yeah. Well, kind of. I mean, humility is related, but... Um, yeah, definitely related. But, uh, like, esteeming yourself. Um, it's all about me. Uh, love yourself. Uh, learn to love yourself and all that foolishness without any exaggeration it, it's of the devil and i can say that very firmly because the bible what it teaches so verses like this where he must increase and i must uh, decrease uh speaking about um matthew 16 24 deny yourself take up your cross and follow me uh paul saying i'm nothing it's all about him that we don't live to ourselves, but we um, live for him, Romans 14, on and on. And here's the key thing, guys. Whether John the Baptist or myself, we have no problem with, it's not about me. That's essential. That's extremely important. For a lot of people where they're at, they don't like it when I need a decrease. They don't like any of the things that I'm saying right now because they're so full of themselves that uh, when I say things like I'm nothing and like um, it's all about him and 
I'm just but a pile of dust, uh, Psalm 103. Like, they're like all, oh, my self-esteem is hurt, boo-hoo-hoo. But um, it's supposed to be the case where when we hear these things, if anything, we rejoice. Exactly what we see right here with John the Baptist. When they say, hey, John, uh, teacher, everyone's going to him, John the Baptist isn't, isn't like, oh, my self-esteem is hurt. Why are they all going to him, not me? No, he rejoices. Do you see that? Did you, did you see that right there, verse 29? This joy of mine is complete. Do you see how huge this is? You rejoice in the fact that it's all about him and nothing about me. So this is supposed to be like embedded. This is supposed to be clearly installed in Christians where I lose myself. It's not about me at all. It's all about him. This is so huge. You will not find true joy in yourself. That's just not the design of the God of the universe. The setup and the design of the God of the universe is where it's all about him. His glory, his exaltation. As a matter of fact, I should bring this into the Friday study <laughs> because, um, yeah, so, um, see, uh, God did not create you or me or the universe in such a way where when you find such um, self esteem in yourself, such exaltation in yourself, that you can find true joy and fulfillment in everything. He didn't design it that way. The God of the universe didn't design it that way. He designed it in such a way that you can find the highest, most amazing, indescribable delight and joy when you find him and when you come to be in a place where your rejoicing is in him and he's your everything. And you get teary-eyed, you rejoice, and it's just... It's indescribable when you see him exalted, when you see him esteemed, when he's worshipped. That's supposed to be the Christian, just like right here in John the Baptist. He wasn't discouraged at all. He rejoiced at the fact that it was all about him. Everyone's going to him. So I hope you come to be in this kind of place, guys. I thank God. God... Uh, um, save me from falling into the modern day self-esteem garbage. Um, I thank God for that, that by his grace, he uh, plunged me into the Bible so that I can know true theology. Uh, seriously, because this is extremely huge. You hear about like self-esteem, love yourself, forgive yourself, self-confidence, look to yourself all over the place. You can look up uh, quotes and images on Google. You can find pastors teaching on uh, love yourself and all that's filthy garbage. True joy and satisfaction and just everything is found in him and knowing him and wanting him and uh, being in a place where his exaltation is your joy. Um, that's exactly what you see all throughout the Bible with all of God's people. When his reputation is harmed, I'm most grieved. I'm just heartbroken. My heart is ripped. When he's exalted, I am full of joy. I get teary-eyed. That's God's people. So don't get influenced. Don't fall into any of this filthy garbage out there. Uh, it only damages you. Um, Satan's behind it, so. 31, he who comes from above is above all, Christ. Look at this foundational difference. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. The whole absolute difference between Christ, God, and creatures. Our origin is different. He who comes from heaven is above all. And then 32, and what he has seen and heard, he testifies, and no one receives his testimony, because no one received Christ's testimony. And then uh, he who has received his testimony has certified that God is true. So what, when Jesus proclaimed and taught, when people received his teaching and testimony, 
they were certifying that God is true. They were, they were taking God's testimony um, of his son. And 34, for he whom God has sent speaks the words of God. For God does not give the spirit by measure. The Holy Spirit, the amount of the Holy Spirit being given for the son. And then the father loves his son. Amen. And has given everything into his hand. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. Amen. Because they're receiving God's testimony about his Son. And then he who does not, I don't know what translation you have, believe or obey, but this is more uh, more like uh, ob obey. So he who um, does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So the parallel is believing in the Son, having everlasting life, not obeying the Son, um, basically perishing, going to hell. The wrath of God abides on him. So depending on how you take Christ, the Son of God, who's God's testimony, if you receive him, accept him, you're taking God's testimony. Okay, you, you know the whole thing of witness and testimony, right? Somebody testifies, I mean, this goes, goes on all the time in, in courts and things like that, where they're witnesses. I bear witness that this happened, I saw this happen, uh, all that kind of stuff. And sometimes people, they accept the testimony. Yes, we believe you, we believe your testimony. But if you say, we don't receive your testimony, they're saying, uh, you're a liar, we can't trust you. Well, Jesus is God's testimony. That's, that's why verse 33 and such, verse 32, 33 about the whole testimony, a witness. God is saying, this is my son. He's my testimony. So when people receive Jesus, they believe him. They're saying, God, we believe you. We accept your testimony. But if they don't believe Jesus, the truths about him, that he is the Messiah, he's the son of God. They're saying, God, we don't believe you. No, no, we don't believe you, God. Basically, you're a liar. You're, you're not trustworthy. But yeah, so he who believes in the Son has everlasting life. But then he who does not obey the Son, because that's a parallel. If you believe the Son, the obedience is a given. Uh, of course, this is not a per, you know perfect obedience of everything. But as a lifestyle, you do uh, obey him. Um, later on in John 14, you know, if you love me, you will keep my commands. That kind of thing. So there's that contrast. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a given that if you believe the Son, you will uh, obey Him, you will follow Him. Versus if you don't believe the Son, of course you, you dismiss Him, you don't, you don't obey Him, He has nothing to do with you, and uh, you're headed towards destruction. But, so any uh, thoughts, questions? All right, so um, we can pray and we can go on some. Lord, thank you for this blessed time, Lord. Just going over these truths is such a blessing. Um, thank you for this time. And Lord God, getting to see uh, um, Naomi, um, I think Elimelech, the husband, wife, sons. Naomi, of course, is the focus and uh, all her loss, uh, disobedience, leaving you. Well, not completely leaving you, but leaving your promised land and all the suffering and your sovereignty. But how you amazingly work in your sovereignty of getting through their sin in a way uh, at least borderline sin if not sin through through those bad choices end up getting one of your elect to become the woman that would eventually birth the messiah it's amazing and then getting to see john the baptist his ministry lord who so honored you who was all about you who pointed to you lord may we um have been affected by uh, this time and teaching and these truths he must increase and i must decrease lord many people today are in a place where they would be discouraged if they heard i must decrease it's just so sad even in christendom uh it's understandable for pagans but even for professing christians how they'd be discouraged but lord please be merciful let them learn truth and let them come to be in such a place where they don't care about them decreasing because it's all about you anyways. Oh Lord, may we have this treasure. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.